have your way in this place. We ask you, God, to have your way in our hearts, have your way in our lives. We ask you to transform us today. Your word tells us to not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the truth. God, we ask you, Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, to transform us today, God. Father, break every shackle. Break off all the blinders. Break every hardness of heart. God, break off every deafening thing that would try to plug our ears that we couldn't hear your voice. Let us see what you see, God. Let us hear you clearly. Father, let our yea and amen not only be for the things we ask for, but for the things you've commanded. That we'll look to you and we'll say yes and amen. Not our will, but your will, yes and amen. Father, ask for an anointing that makes preaching easy. An anointing that makes hearing your word a delight. An anointing, Father, that excites us at your voice. Let your voice be heard in my voice, God, in your words and my words. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. All right, I got a couple of scriptures and then it's funny I pulled up in here today and I sat in the vehicle and I started typing stuff on my my phone and I get out the car and Ricky said, I wonder who he's chewing out. I said, no, man, I had some things that my spirit I had to write down. I said, you never know things change in an instant around here. And then I've had a whole bunch of stuff stirring in and out during worship. And so I'm just going to see where this goes and how many people I can offend love at the same time. <laughs> well, I'm going to offend you today. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read about 18 verses out of there. Verse 1 through 18. It says this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief uh, priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired, of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people in Israel, my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. <laughs> Look at the convenience of this liar. He didn't say, oh, I'm coming with y'all. He said, y'all go find him and let me know when you got him. I don't want to waste my time looking around for the Lord. I'm going to come worship him also. Already that's not worship. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. You know, if there is ever anything that makes you question whether God really meant he put a firmament over the earth he created, if there's anything that ever makes you really question whether or not he really made a greater light and lesser light, one to govern the day and one to govern the night, and all the stars for signs, seasons, and times, and to light the earth and put them inside the firmament. 
If anything ever made you question whether or not you were really spinning at 1,000 miles to the east and 66,600 miles per hour around a sun or anything like that, this right here should tell you because tell me how this would be possible, that there would be a star that they saw in the sky and it moved towards the east to guide them. It was moving within the earth. The birth of Jesus undoes everything Nasha ever did. If anyone who says, what is that? That is Hebrew for to deceive. In English, it is Nasa. until it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, somebody say treasure. When they opened their treasures, how many of y'all kids going to open some treasures this year? I wonder if Jesus did what these treasures, what our kids do with the treasures we give them. I wonder if Jesus got up and broke all the treasures and didn't want them no more in 30 minutes. <laughs> they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men was exceedingly angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem somebody say Merry Christmas and in all its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men then was fulfilled uh, what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying a voice was heard and Rama lamentation weeping and great mourning Rachel weeping for her children refusing to be comforted because they are no more um, the song silver and gold I know that song silver and gold the Bible says this in Acts chapter 3 that now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, uh, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from him. Then Peter said, silver and gold, silver and gold. <laughs> That ain't what it said. He ain't start singing that tune, did he? It says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Merry Christmas. He said, rise up and walk. You may be seated. try to fill my way through this thing because this is the lie of Christmas <laughs> that we deal with every year there is the lie of Christmas we prefer the lie of Christmas don't we it's quiet in this Christmas church there is a lie of Christmas that we that we love and that we buy into every year now listen I'm gonna talk a little bit about it no, I'm not going to go real deep because this ain't a message about Saturnalia. If you, if you ain't know, you know by now. This ain't a message about Nimrod, Tammuz, uh, Marduk, or any of, of these other uh, December 25th replications. Uh, no, 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 no. It don't need to be. We did that. We did that, and people can do that on their own. Um, but, but this is, and, and the reason this is not that, because let me be clear, how you celebrate 
the birth of Jesus does not offend or affect me to the depth like that. You know why? My birthday is February 12th. You know who else's birthday is February 12th? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Did y'all know that? I've known it for 41 years. <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln said, could he have stopped the Civil War without freeing a single slave? He wouldn't have. Did y'all know that? If he could have prevented the Civil War without freeing a single slave, he would have. So when I celebrate my birthday or y'all come over my house to celebrate my birthday, y'all are not celebrating a man who wish that, that, that he would not have freed the slaves. If my birthday falls on a Tuesday, I always say this, and my party is on Friday. Where's Ron? Is Ron in here today? He's in kids today. So Ron had his 50th birthday by 11 months into being... How, how long? <laughs> but his wife made a promise and said, we're going to take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> so we know he was 50 and 9 tenths when we went to the birthday party. But it didn't make it less celebratory of Ron being 50. And whoever's birthday it really fell on didn't make it less Ron celebratory or us honoring him and his birthday and his accomplishments. So that don't bother me. It don't bother me if, if we want to honor Jesus, his birth on this day, because the truth is we should honor his birth every day. So it don't bother me. And, and the fact, Romans chapter 14 say, don't let it bother you. What it says is, if you esteem one day holy, and someone else don't esteem it holy, neither one is wrong. It says, for the one who uh, 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 sees a day as holy does it as unto the Lord, and the one who doesn't, doesn't do it as unto the Lord. So, uh, this, is, this is okay. It's just so long as your freedom is not a stumbling block to your brother. So, if you see meat, as, it says, as being sacrificed to idols, um, then, or, or your brother does, and you don't, you shouldn't have meat in front of them, because when you eat it, you eat it in freedom. They eat it in fear. They condemn themselves. So, so when you come in and you, we've seen a, um, uh, I want to call it a progression, even though it's a, we've kind of digressed as far as decor over the years. Last year we had a whole city on the stage. The year before that we had a whole a bigger city in the, in the thing. And, and so we have digressed in our decor within the building, uh, but that we have really progressed in our worship within the building. So, so somebody may come in and they're looking for a Christmas experience in December in the church. We're not here to provide that for you. Because here was the Christmas experience around Jesus being born. People lost their children. This is the truth of his birth. His birth caused a king or, or a governor to have all of the male children slaughtered. Now, if I preach to you that which is the birth of Christ and ask you uh, to protect God's work, would you allow your family to pay a price? Versus telling you that it's all about your children. So if the spirit that, that came to attack Jesus when he was born was to kill the children, what do you think spoiling your children every year and making his day or honoring him about them does to them? Makes them smile dying. Slow deaths. Because when men become lovers of themselves and worshipers of themselves, they move further into death. When they decide that they can be like God. Deserving worship, deserving honor. Mind you, this is not about not getting your kids gifts. Just talking to you about progression. Get your kids some gifts, please. <laughs> please get them something. <laughs> They've been lonely for a long time. You ain't bought them nothing all year. Get them some shoes, some socks, something. <laughs> but this is what we see. 
this is what we see in, 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 in the real birth of Christ. And in the modern story that we pitch unto our churches and pitch unto our people, we turn churches into winter wonderlands while altars have been bare for a long time. We turn churches into uh, Santa's workshops while baptismals have been empty for a long time. And we, we lay bare in the altars of God to, to build the altars of old Saint Nick. And we, we, here, here's the problem with that. Let's talk about plan and strategy. Churches go broke trying to keep up with Christmas. Not just your family or my family trying to keep up with the Joneses, but churches go broke because if we don't provide you the premier Christmas experience, you're going to go down the street where Cirque du Soleil is happening in the altars of the other churches. You're gonna take your kid to take a picture with Santa over there. So we have to have, to have some exuberant budget or, or man hours. See, the thing is being mobile church, it takes a lot of man hours to set up a Christmas village every week or to set this up. So we pay the cost and man hours. We pay the cost and supplies. And, and, and we have to pay whatever it is that you require. Don't worry, it's gonna get better. This is not a rebuke, this is a good teacher. When, when the expense of, of, of entertaining you rises, the responsibility of raising you leaves. When the expense of entertaining you rises, the responsibility of raising you leaves. And what I mean by that is because my costs go up, I can't correct the big givers the way I need to. Now, I'm not talking about Daniel Rios. We'll have church in the parking lot. <laughs> Lights off and all that. <laughs> but this is what happens then is those who are the big givers or consistent givers don't get the correction that is needed them. Because if they leave, they take, they tithe with them. And, I, and, and, and a pastor has, has extended his budget. Because he thinks that's what attracts and brings in. And now those who write the checks have created the culture and the culture dictates its leadership. So, so we see this. And um, the reality of it is it goes backwards. It's a backwards idea because do I want you in the spirit of the season or in the spirit of God? And if the spirit of the season is the spirit of God, why can't we call it the spirit of God? So if you have to change his name, it's not him. There's only one name known among men by which we must be saved. He says, if you deny me in front of your brothers, I'll deny you in front of my father. So if in order to fit in, you do like Peter and deny that you ever knew the man, it's not the same spirit. The spirit of God don't hide from nobody. He don't, he don't, he don't disguise himself with another name. No, that's a different spirit. That is one that presents himself like an angel of light or a roaring lion or, or shifts his name all throughout and twists and turns. So you get that. And, 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 and so for entertainment purposes only, churches have uh, all this stuff that's going on. Now listen, we are the decoration for the house of God. Look how beautiful you are. Look at these ugly sweaters. Don't that make you feel like you love your neighbor? Y'all remember them cookies y'all had? I didn't get to have none. But, <laughs> but didn't that make you feel like family? Y'all remember, remember uh, praying over toys and taking them to them sick children in the hospital? Didn't it make you feel like family? Do we need snowflakes on the stage? And lights lit around everything? And, 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 and wit red warlocks walking around with their little imps in green shoes? Do we need it? Do we need that running around? Do we need to buy into their North Pole deception? Do we need the entertainment of it? Do we need Christmas plays and, and, and all of such? You know the word entertainment should never even be in the church. You want entertainment, go to the theater. You want entertainment, go to a ball game. 
Not on Sunday morning. Uh, but if you want entertainment, go somewhere else. And the reason I say that is because entertainment, the word means to hold captive. How can the word entertainment be used within the church when we operate in freedom, supposedly? God don't hold nobody captive. We who were free men became slaves willfully under Christ. So I shouldn't be captivating you. I should be discipling you. And we sing songs like silver and gold, but we find them we have it backwards. Because the world tells us silver and gold, silver and gold, but the Bible tells us that wisdom is better than silver and gold. Better than fine rubies, that we, should, that we should exchange it, that we should buy the truth and sell it not. The Bible tells us, Peter says, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give you. We ain't supposed to chase that. The, the spirit of the season says, oh, say Nick. I think Saint Nick sounds a lot like satanic. And they don't do anything on accident. There's no Saint Nicholas within the scripture. And I don't recognize no authority of no Catholic church. Maybe you do. But can't no man make a man a saint. In fact, we all are saints in him. So to distinguish one above another as if you God. Oh, that's what you told your people, that you were God. No, 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 no. We don't re re uh, recognize that. The Nicholas that I see within Scripture led the Nicolaitans, who God hated in the book of Revelations. So we see this stuff running through uh, the holiday season, and, and, and then the church gets divided and starts arguing. Uh, we argue about things because we, we understand that uh, Santa Claus is a warlock and a witch. We know it. We know the, the history of it. So, so we, we, don't, we don't got uh, him coming down no chimneys around here. Demons sneak in your house. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> Anyone who opens, I'll come in and sup with them, but I ain't sneaking in the window. I, I, I ain't keeping a list and checking it twice. He got one list, the Lamb's Book of Life. He ain't got to write down a record of your wrong because love don't do that. And he is God who loves. So one that keeps a record of wrong is Antichrist. So we don't buy into uh, all of that. And, and we don't get caught into the nonsense. But we, I mean, I'll enjoy Rudolph with his nose so bright. <laughs> I can't go no further because Santa Claus is a witch. <laughs> If you're in here and you believe in Santa Claus and you didn't tell your children, well, sorry. not sorry. <laughs> Should have been quit lying to them. <laughs> but, but then the church gets to start arguing about things like methodology and reaching the laws. And if we use Santa Claus, if you use a witch to, to attract people, you are not operating in Christ. I don't care how, how you can polish it and how much lipstick you put on a pig. At the end of the day, when you use a witch and magic to attract people to a powerful God, it doesn't make any sense scripturally or logically uh, in the world to me. Um, we argue about things like Christmas trees. You know the Bible don't say nothing about Christmas trees. But there's, there, we get people that, 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 that put out memes, unsaved people who will, who will scour the Bible to find a contradiction and put out memes on social media or something to give you something out of context to make you argue with your brethren. Amen. Jeremiah 10 has a verse in it talking about going out and cutting down trees and, and then putting, lacing them with silver and gold and bringing them in into the tents, Right? And, and they have taken this one verse and made this one verse about Christmas trees when the truth is, if you read the whole chapter, they were talking about idol makers that went into the wood, cut down trees, brought them into the house and carved them up and then covered them in silver or gold and then nailed them to a wall. And God says they don't talk and they don't move and they don't feel. That's what you want to pray to. And he, and he breaks the idea of worshiping false gods and false idols that don't move and don't talk and can't hear you. 
It has nothing to do with Christmas trees. And then, then it'll totally ignore Isaiah's scripture and prophecy and his eschatology of end times when God comes in and in his altar, he fills his people and make them like firs and evergreens and, 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 and trees of strength within his altar. And that his light is the glory that shines upon them. We ignore the scriptures that say that, that cursed is he who hangs upon a tree. Talking about Jesus on the cross. So, so we, we forget that there was a tree of life. And that Jesus hanging on the cross represented the reinstitution of the tree of life. That don't mean go have a Christmas tree if you feel convicted by it. And that don't mean you got to not have one if you don't feel convicted by it. It means stop fussing. Right? Unity in the body. Do everything within you to keep the peace, the Bible says. So, so when it comes down to stuff like that, the reality of it is you can really pick apart the Bible and find a verse to justify anything you want. So, with that being the case, if you have the faith for it, don't do it in front of your brother who does not have the faith for it. Right? What you do in faith, they do in fear. They condemn themselves. So if you love your neighbor like yourself, you know what? Maybe we just got to keep the Christmas trees off the stage. And I ain't got no problem with it. Maybe we should keep that McDonald's cup off the stage. Can somebody get that and throw that in the trash? That is nasty. I don't think that's none of our people. It's probably from the dancers gallery, but we still got to keep, oh, it's still cold than it is our people. And we all got eyes. Let's not let that happen. That, that, that quenches the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Quench your thirst, but it quenched the spirit. All right. I got to be quick because I was told we got to get out of here early today. Y'all think I can do it? I don't know, but I'm going to do my best. I'm thankful to the worship team. <laughs> do all things through Christ. I'm thankful to the worship team that, 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 uh, that, that, that uh, did not uh, take long to get into the presence of God and was able to usher us in. I'm thankful to the Lord for blowing the sub because uh, that makes us want to hurry up and get to the presence of God faster because we, we got the wrong in the room, you know. We're like, all right, let's hurry up and, and get to the Lord because this sound is a little light, you know. <laughs> so, and it makes the people worship. So I'm, I'm thankful for that because now I get up in here and I get to run it out. Y'all ready? All right, Lucas, I know you, you're translating, so just stick with me. Wording is important. Wording is important, you know, and, and I know when I start talking about stuff about, about the spirit of Christmas or this and that, people look at me a little bit like I'm crazy. Uh, I, but that's okay, because you're so, the, the things of God are supposed to look like foolishness to the world. If it looks like foolishness to a believer, we have to then check whether we are carnal-minded or not, because it's the things of the spirit that are foolishness to a carnal mind. So, so I don't have a problem pointing out the defactors and the things that, that detract us in the world because I believe personally, personally, that every single thing that the world offers is a lie. Yeah. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So if he's the God of this world according to the scriptures that are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, then Scripture says that the truth ain't in him. His native tongue is a lie. When he tried to tell the truth, it come out a lie. Even if the words was true, there's no truth in it. He'll use facts in order to lead you down to deception. And then this is the world that he, that, that, that the world system that, that, that the devil reigns over. And so there is nothing in it that benefits a Christian. This is my, this is my thinking according to Scripture. According to scripture, I am an ambassador for Christ. According to, don't worry, it's going to get a little more Christmassy than this. According to scripture, I am a foreigner here in the world, but not of the world. And the kingdom that I am a part of, uh, the, the kingdoms of this world seems to be at war and odds with the kingdom I'm a part of. I don't go into then enemy's territory as a foreigner that is taxed by the enemy thinking that any law or any system is put in place to benefit me. No, they hate me. They hate my God. They hate you. They hate what you believe. They hate what you represent. They hate the kingdom you come from. 
So there's nothing then that is here that is at peace with the kingdom of God. So then whatever they put out in this backwards world is opposite that and benefits you nothing. So when it comes down to engaging in uh, 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 holiday practices, make sure that you are doing those things as honor to God and you are honoring God because if you do it their way, even in fun, it is an enemy. Made in the system of an enemy. And, um, and I say that, and I say anything. I, there's nothing I believe the, the government of the United States of America has ever done to benefit me. This is going to be hard for some patriots. Um, but I was in the Air Force. I fought in Iraq. And I have come to learn that the, the flag of the United States of America is not my banner. Because my banner is him. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. That when I switch kingdoms, I walk under a different banner. Which is, which is why I don't need your license in your second amendment. God has given me the authority to protect myself and my family. Jesus said, take with you two swords. Which is why I don't need, I don't need any protections as a citizen of the United States of America because I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. So, so I, I know people, they, they like to be wishy-washy, but America is not for God. Jesus is not American. No kingdom in this world except for Israel and, and Judah can claim Jesus. It's going to get more Christmassy. Watch me. I say that to say... Uh, while we argue things about citizenship and this and, and customs, no custom, no law was ever made to benefit the kingdom. And it's all in wording. Because in wording, they will tell you that they love God. Your politician you voted for will say that he loves God or serves God. And then you watch the Defense of Marriage Act be signed almost unanimously by both the representatives you voted for and voted against. Uh, which really, the only difference in this one says that the church can be sued. We watch abortion stay legal everywhere. We watch pronouns become a legal thing while their sons are beating up your daughters in a wrestling match. It shows you that the wording, they say one thing, but it meant something else. Somebody say wording. Wording, wording is important in these days because the serpent deceived uh, Eve with one word. God said you eat it, you die. The serpent said you won't certainly die. Just added one word. The Bible says that a kind word turns away wrath. That's how important your words are. It says that the centurion comes to Jesus and has an issue in his home and Jesus coming, he said all you have to really do is send a word. Just send out the right word. Mary is dealing with the angel who's telling her that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon her, and she said, how can it be? She starts looking at the world systems and how the body functions and the flesh and the earth, and she says, how can it be? I never knew a man. Nevertheless, at your word, let it be unto me according to your word. A single word will undo and change everything. For instance, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? Whosoever believe in him should not die or perish, but have everlasting life. A lot of people quote that verse and say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You know, if you remove the word begotten, just one word out of that scripture, it calls the whole Bible into question. Because Genesis 6 said, when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. So if this is God's only son, who are these? So now you give the world an opportunity to have contention with the flow of the scriptures because you missed one word. This is how the, that's how the enemy works. It just slip a word in on you, change a slight meaning, change a slight definition, make it so similar to what you believe that, 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 that you can find Jesus in Santa Claus. One word. And uh, we think that wording isn't important. 
and we think that we shouldn't have to uh, be responsible and also be relieved for our words or our wording. We say stuff like, you know what I meant. No, I heard what you said. And since it's the words of your mouth that shape what's around you, don't get mad at me that I responded to what I heard, not what you meant. Take more time to communicate what you meant properly. Don't say yes and amen to everything. When someone's talking to you and you don't agree, don't be like, yeah, 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 I, get, I understand, or, or I agree. I don't agree with anything people say to me. They, they, they just talking to me and they, they want, they stop and get agreement out of you. I'll be like, I hear you. Keep going. You don't get no agreement out of me. I, I need to hear it all before you even get a nod from me. This is why contracts in the world are so important. When we get into then theology based on these words, uh, no one teaches you Christmas <laughs> may cost you your family. That the birth of Christ may cost you something. Rather, they taught you to at all costs defend that thing that's right here. and Don't pay any mind to the man behind the curtain that's sending orders down to destroy your children. And the church then starts teaching, uh, all you got to do is believe for stuff. R. Kelly starts singing. If I believe it, I can receive it. And then he believes he can fly. He's a fool. Lived a fool's life, paying a fool's cost. But we, we do this in the church, that if, if you believe this, this and that, and then we change theology, and we write songs about it, and, and all of this stuff, and we'll say things like, like uh, uh, when we preach the walls of Jericho coming down, we say things like, if you believe this, God will tear the walls down. Well, that ain't what the story said. We say things like, if you believe this, you can walk on water. Well, that ain't what the scripture said. We say things like, you know, if, if you believe this, uh, uh, God will heal you. Well, that's not what the scripture said exclusively. Because, because you have to then, and this has moved out of the church, which is what, and this is why the, the lie of Christmas has been able to flourish, because it's all on belief. And they teach you that if you don't believe in magic, Santa Claus disappears. So, so, so when you look at belief versus obedience, now we, now we enter into the scriptures. They didn't believe the walls would fall down. They believed God enough to walk around the walls for seven days. God said, this is how you do it. Obey it. And when you are obedient, this will happen. Peter said, if it's you, Lord, bid me to come. And he said, come. So he stepped out at his word. It was his obedience to the word of God that caused uh, uh, him to operate in the miraculous. We think that we could just believe it without being obedient to God. No, you just want to manifest it. And that's why the church has been caught up in this new age witchcraft because we have taught you that you can speak what you want into the air and give affirmations and never even know God. Now, be belief is good for salvation, right? As if you believe with your heart. But watch this. And then confess with your mouth. Then you shall be saved. Um, belief and obedience are interconnected. They are not mutually exclusive. That's why faith without works is dead, Scripture says. Because it ain't just what you believe, it's what you're about to do. Paul said, I'll show you my faith with my works. You know, we don't, we, don't, we don't believe for stuff. We obey our God. Amen. And, and watch how backwards the world is to take what God meant and aim it at the devil. Uh, we don't teach our kids to just believe Santa Claus for stuff. We teach them to obey him. If you don't be good and you get on the wrong list, he's going to give you coal. So don't believe you'll get something good if you don't do what he expects. And kids will live their year to obey this witch. Nobody in here, this is just a culture. And, uh, but we don't believe for stuff. We just obey God. And what we know then is that if we seek first the kingdom, this stuff gets added to us. We know that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, 
that, that he will appoint or give us the desires of our heart. This is why Jesus didn't say go and, go and tell them to believe. He didn't say go into all the world and teach them to believe. He said go make disciples of all nations and, com- and, and teach them to do all that I have commanded. Amen. He said and then these signs will follow them that believe. Obedience is a prerequisite to belief. That, 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 that if you obey, it expresses your belief. But you teach people to do what God said, and the more they do it, it increases the stock of their belief because they've seen his faithfulness. So we come, all right, I'm watching it. So, so then we come to the birth of Christ. I'm almost finished with my first point. <laughs> then we come to the birth of Christ. And um, we have a real Jesus. And our real Jesus is not a, I just come to make everything okay, grace, 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 God. That's not the real Jesus. Uh, he does have grace. But he does have law. And people will teach you he did away with the law. But he says, I come to fulfill it, not to do away with it. He says, now one word will pass away. So then what does it mean then, this, this, this conflict that I have then between Paul telling me if I keep one law, I got to keep all the law. And then Christ died in vain. Now I got this conflict in me. Which is, they've used this works versus faith idea to really make you lay down obedience to God's word and just think you can hope your way into the kingdom. So this is what really happened. When Jesus was born, the standard was raised, not lowered. We see it in him. Jesus relived Israel's pattern of life in front of them. What was Israel's pattern of life? Is that they were God's people. And as they walked out their cultural lives over the the first couple of thousand years, that many times they walked away from God. And because they walked away from God, then they was put in crazy persecution. Slavery, bondage, persecuted on every side. And so Jesus relives this in front of them, being uh, the word of God in the flesh, coming and walking it out, and then being persecuted right in front of them being beaten right in front of them, being taken captive right in front of them, yet without sin. So he was saying, this is how you do it. That you should be able to go through all kind of uh, affliction and all kind of persecution and not walk away from God when you do it. The standard was raised. Because uh, he went through much tribulation and he was still obedient to God. Now, now get, get this. You ready? Grace. Somebody shout grace. grace. Grace makes things easier. Would you agree? So then grace does kind of take the restriction of the law, and it's like, well, it's kind of easy to beat the law with the grace of God. Yes? But so that you would know how powerful the grace of God was, the standard was raised to show the strength of that grace. Say what you mean, Pastor. When Jesus is born, the law increased. It didn't go away. It increased. Let me let me let me show it to you. Jesus said, according to the law of Moses, that you're not supposed to commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in his heart. That standard just went way up from staying out of her bedroom to keeping her out of your vision and your thought process. So now I really need this grace because no man can stand under the law of Jesus. No man can stand under that law without the spirit of God and the grace of God. So so people who want to grab onto the grace without ever even accessing the spirit, you don't even have the grace. But the law increased for all at his word. 
making you need his grace because you thought you could keep the law before with some lamb and, and, and these ceremonies. He made it impossible for the law to be kept without him. He says, the law says you should not murder. But I say, anyone who looks at his brother with anger without cause is a murderer in his heart. Anyone who calls his brother a fool is in danger of hell fire. He increased it from murder to being angry without cause. What's angry without cause? You listen to a little rumor, a little gossip. Somebody says somebody said something that they never said, and you mad at them, and they never said it. You are angry without cause. And you could say, well, it was cause. Somebody told me this. No, no, that's a fool's cause. Because, because the Bible said let every truth be established with two witnesses. You know, you know, one way that you can deal with unforgiveness and that false anger is just sticking to the scripture and having two witnesses. You said they said what? Let's call them right now. Let's see if we can establish this with two witnesses. Because if, if I can't establish it with two witnesses, well, then I don't got nothing to be bothered with. Now I don't get a bitterness that I have to forgive, and I have just disempowered the lie. Do you know... Another witness disempowers the lie. You're only able to be lied to when, you get, when you're in the corner talking to one person. When you're gossiping on the phone and no one can hear but you. When you're texting just between you and them. But if you get another witness in there, but oh, no one want nobody in their business today. The world has convinced you that people are being nosy. No, God is trying to hold you out of hell. Because the devil is tricking people into being angry without cause because he was a murderer from the beginning. He raised the standard. He raised the standard of giving. There I go again. I need warm water from there. <laughs> he raised the standard of giving. Giving. Every time my voice crack, it was going to treat like a cuss cup. You ever had a cuss cup in your, jo in your job? Everybody going to put a dollar in the cuss cup every time my voice crack. <laughs> giving. Somebody say giving. giving. He raised the standard for giving. Um, you know, before there was the tithe. It was the offering and feast of tabernacles. The different places where offerings were given. But you go from tithing in the law. To, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son. Now, now that means it went from 10% of my increase, it went from my first fruits offering, it went from my Pentecost offering, it went from all these to my firstborn child, my only born child. Imagine, this was the cost of Christmas. That because Herod could not kill Jesus, everyone lost their firstborn son. But God did it first. For God so loved the world, so the standard of giving increased. People will leave a church if you correct their children. They'll leave a church if you say something about how they raised their children. And, and so this right here, it says, uh, who, you can tithe, that's okay. Uh, good, keep that standard, but let's fulfill it. Are you going, would you give all? Why does that have to go to your children? Because Jesus knew in these days we worship our children. And so he gives his only begotten son. That word that was made flesh stepped in and gave his life. When he ascended, he gave his spirit. He teaches us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be, right? Our heart's going to be there also. And he demonstrated it by telling us basically that he so loved us that we were his treasure. So his heart was with us. And he came down and gave it all. And where your heart will be, your treasure will be also. And then when the church is built, we get into the book of Acts. They, they, don't, they don't give 10%. They gave everything. They sold their homes and laid it all before the church so that none within the church would have need. 
Anyone who has an argument against biblical tithing that does not come and lay 100% of what they have on the altar is a liar you should ignore. Don't quote New Testament giving. And don't quote Paul talking about love offerings of the heart. If you don't quote the book of Acts where men died for lying about submitting to God all of their things. It caused men their lives because the standard was raised. Men didn't die when they didn't tithe. They just got a small little 5% usury added to it. They could repay that tithe with interest. But you can't repay your life. The standard was raised. This is the story, the true story of the birth of our God. We didn't get lower and weaker. We came up higher and stronger as kings and priests. Now it's expected we keep the law because kings make the law. Priests uphold the law. He didn't make us prostitutes and pimps. He didn't make us gang bangers and, 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 and vagabonds, vagabonds, however you say it. He didn't make us vagrants and paupers. And get this. At this point when Jesus does this, this is not new. This is not a new thing. Uh, which is why he didn't have to do away with what was, because this is not new. I'm going to blow through this as much as I can, because uh, we got a time limit today. They got a dance recital in here. Luke 24 says this, 25 through 27 says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, who? O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. They didn't believe everything that was written. He said, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Moses writes the Torah, right? This is, these are the first five books of scripture. This is the, uh, the Pentateuch. And then all throughout the Old Testament, or, or what Israel calls the Tanakh, from, from the first prophet that wrote it down, all the way through, the whole story from Genesis to Revelation is about Jesus. It's not new. So he's, he's schooling them on the scripture saying, oh, you foolish and slow of heart. And he starts breaking them down from Moses through all the prophets, that about the Messiah. So we see him there. You know, then we got to jump back to the beginning there. We're going to jump to the beginning. Y'all ready to jump around? Are oh, y'all ready to jump around? Just the five that I heard talk back to me. What about that back row that ain't even bobbing their head at me? Y'all ready to jump around? All right, I'm watching y'all. Y'all watch know I can see at least the shadow of a thing. You know it's rude to ignore people when they talk to you. Don't be rude. Who's that, Bobby Brown? New edition, don't be rude. Genesis, don't be cruel, that's right. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to jump back to the beginning, right? Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. We get this story about Cain and Abel. And uh, we know Cain kills Abel, right? And in the story about Cain and Abel, after Cain brings his offering to God, God is not pleased with it. We're talking about giving. We're talking about a giving God who already knows the end from the beginning. So when Jesus is walking them through these scriptures at the very same time to him, not to us because we ain't there yet, he's back over here dealing with Cain at the same time. So it's easy to be displeased with what you're given. And, and Cain's offering is displeasing to God, and Abel's is pleasing to God. And so right before uh, the murder, but after the giving, there's always a time period of God's grace after, after, the, after the failure of the standard and the murder you commit next. And, and God says to him, he says, he says, Cain, what are you downcast for? He says, sin lies at the door. He desires to have you, but you must rule over him. In Genesis 4-7, God depicts sin as a he. He desires you, but you must rule him. In Romans chapter 7, Paul paints the same picture similarly when he says, the things I want to do or know to do, I don't do. 
And he starts going this, in this wrestling back and forth. He says, so therefore, if I want to do what's right and I don't, he says, it's not me who does wrong, but sin who dwells in me. So that I know then when I want to do good that there is another there with me trying to do evil. So Paul depicts sin then also as a personality or, or its own person because the reality of it is Jesus didn't come to defeat Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. Jesus said, I saw him cast down from heaven like lightning. That ain't why Jesus came. The enemy was sin. Men were bound then to sin, bound to disobedience. And because the wage then of sin is death, Jesus paid sin, not Satan. A lot of people put up this stupid stuff like, oh, God would kill his own son and not the devil. That don't make no sense. It do make sense because God could kill the devil and we still bound to sin. Because sin is the enemy. So sin is in there thinking it runs something. And, 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 and it's, it's described as a person. And what we see here then, the way this entrance begins to happen is that Cain's giving didn't match God's giving. It didn't match God's standard. Wow. It's the fruit of the land, which is what Cain gave because he was a farmer, while Abel being a shepherd gave the fat of the land. And God in Genesis 3, the last verse of the chapter, gives them skins to cover and shows that the wages of sin are death and it takes a blood sacrifice. So God gives them animal skins to cover their sin. So when it's time to give an offering to God, Cain, his standard didn't match God's standard. And since Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth, and he's the word, of God, and, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and then he said, let us make man in our image, and then they heard the voice of God walking on the wind, then who is it then that provided the flesh for them? Now here he comes, and you give me these pineapples, or potatoes, or lychee. <laughs> you give me the <laughs> soursop, and Who wants this sour sop? <laughs> side note, side note. Y'all good with a little side note? Yeah. So, so if you study scripture, do you know one of the great things about this story, if you really dig into it, is you find that one thing that doesn't exist in the heaven is flesh. Right? Jesus said, no man has, has, has uh, been ascended to heaven except him who dis first descended to heaven, the son of man who is in heaven now. Right? But, but there's no flesh that can glory in his presence. Angels are not flesh. God is a spirit. There's no flesh in heaven. But if you read Genesis chapter 2, this is the count or the generations as God created uh, the heavens and the earth is that he created the heavens and the earth and he created all of the plants that grow in the heavens but had not yet placed them into the earth because no rain had come on it and there was no man to till the ground. That the plants were created in the heaven and they were held there until God made a man to till the ground. So, don't offer God what he already has in heaven. Let's get back to the word. I'll teach that another day. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. Uh, <laughs> Merry Christmas. All right. uh, so, <laughs> so what we find then is Cain in his giving would not match God's standard because God gave his life and God gave up life and, and Cain was not willing to give life. So when it came down to his cause, he was okay giving his brother's life, but not his own. Uh, so he took his brother's life. And God comes down, and he's walking through, and he says, where's Abel? He knew where Abel was. And, and he says, I don't know. You seen him? I ain't my brother's keeper. And God says, his blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, how does his blood cry out to God from the ground? except for he made us living souls. And a dead body is not a dead soul. So just because you can bury the flesh of Abel, don't mean you can quiet the voice of Abel. 
Because he's a living soul that was made in God's image. And so when we see God's voice walking on the wind in the cool of the day, uh, and his blood speaks for us, then Abel, being made in God's image, has a voice that cries out from his blood in the same way, calling out to God. And we find ourselves uh, hiding behind the creation that we're supposed to be tending to. What I mean by that is God made this garden of trees and he put a man in there to tend it. And we end up hiding behind the work instead of running after the word. It's Merry Christmas. We're going somewhere else. So Cain, so what happens? Y'all give me 10 minutes. We close? I know we back there. All right. 10 minutes, man. All right. All right, here we go, because we got to get out of here. There's so many things here. When you read the Bible, there's so much that God reveals to us in the scriptures. So Cain, what he does when, when God punishes him, because God tells him, cursed is the ground for your sake. It ain't going to produce nothing for you. It's cursed for you. So Cain goes, the Bible says, and builds a city. This is the manipulation of, of those who don't believe Scripture and try to act like uh, uh, Scripture is contradictory. Well, when Cain went away, there was already a city. No, the Bible says Cain went and built a city. And he took with him his wife. Not that there was a populated city. If you read Genesis 5, you find that, that Adam and Eve, they talked about Cain and Abel, but then they went and kept Seth. And when you deal with genealogies, they only follow really the, the key bloodlines by giving name. So it also says, and they had other sons and daughters. Now, if Seth is born at 130 years, how many sons and daughters is Eve popping out? And before, before the curse of pain during childbearing, she was able to have children without pain. So when God says your seed going to be against their seed and this seed will enmity of that seed, there, there is a populating that is happening. Cain goes and he builds cities, right? Um, and, and, and this is kind of dropped in my spirit that men build cities, um, when they're rejected by the earth. Men build cities when they're rejected by the earth. Because since the earth wouldn't produce for him, and he mourned about it, he went and built a city. All the cities that we had, we were just up in the mountains, and we drove through so much beautiful land. Wow. People producing so much stuff on their land. We drive back into this concrete jungle, and, and nothing is produced. <laughs> nothing grows out of the ground. And, and, and we, know that <laughs> we know that the cities are put together and have been put together the way that they have under Agenda 21 and Agenda 30 where you want to concentrate all of your people into one area to surveil them. So you make it where you have to get a uh, license or, or what is it called? It's uh, zoned commercially so that you can only put stores in certain places so that people then move to those places for easy access. They build cities because the earth has rejected them. And so what you find then is that those who spill blood are those that the earth rejects. And so it's blood spillers that build cities. Now, if you got a job for the city, I'm not saying that's you. You ain't the one who built it. You are employed by the builder. And so blood spillers build cities. Which is why we see Jesus spill his own blood. Because he's coming to redeem Adam, Adam or earth. And he's coming and building the city of God. He's going to do away with this earth because this earth has rejected him. Wow. Let me get lighter. It's Christmas. Uh, here's what happens. I'm going to get really Christmassy. Two minutes and then just come in. All right. No matter where I'm at, no matter where I'm at in two minutes, I'm going to shut it down because I'm going to give you all at least 30 minutes to, to clean up thoroughly, you know what I mean, and then 15 minutes to get out of the way of the parking lot. <laughs> They're coming in at 1230, I think. All right. Should I just talk faster? So here's what happens. It don't feel like Christmas in here. So here's what happens. Is, is Cain moves off and does this. And the Bible says that Adam knew Eve again, took her knew her again, and Seth is born. Then Seth begot Enosh. It says, and then 
men began to call on the name of the Lord. Something has changed. Adam was put out of the garden. Abel was dead and calling out his blood. Cain was a murderer who raised murderers, not worshipers. So if you read the bloodline of Cain, and watch how similar the enemy tries to set up to steal God's glory, that Cain's son was named Enoch, and Enoch's son was named Lamech. And if you mess up the, the generations, then you think that's the Enoch that walked with God, or that's the Lamech that birthed, Lamech that birthed Noah, but it's not. And, 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 and he went and had two ball cane, and then Lamech comes in and said, I killed a young man for this, and I killed another man for this, and if it's on Cain seven times, it'd be repaid to anyone who harms him, let it be 77 times on any who harm Lamech. So Cain is raising murderers as he's building these cities. These are the cities then that, 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 that Nimrod follows the tracking of. It's your December 25th. Merry Christmas. And so... Um, and there were no more uh, sons that are listed up until Seth. Uh, and Adam is 130 years old at the time. Paul says in Scripture that, that the woman will be saved when he deals with teachers and stuff like that. He says the woman will be saved through childbirth or childbearing. This does not mean that her soul salvation happens from having children. But there is a redemptive quality in birthing children. There's a redemptive quality in legacy. There is something to be understood that better than any sermon that, that a woman could preach is birthing a world changer and raising them in a way that affects everything around them. A mother has more impact on her child than a father ever will. And she can make her child into being a mama's boy or into being a leader in the kingdom. She can argue with them about uh, being about his father's business or she can step back and ponder these things in her heart and raise them in the ways of the Lord. And Eve herself, at this point with Seth, she raises him differently, better than, uh, than she did with Cain. Cain seen her disobedience, but now we got Seth who brings the bloodline of Jesus. So after Seth is born and he has a son, this is when men begin to call on the name of the Lord. Finally, because up until now in the Bible, no one called on God. Nobody. What happened was, uh, until here, God would visit men and call to them. Adam, where are you? Cain, where's Abel? Uh, he'd walk through in the cool of the day, and he'd bring the animals out to, to, to Adam. And he didn't even sit back and look at Adam and say, Adam, is you lonely? He, he sat back and said, I know he's lonely. It's not good for him to be alone. And God came to man. No man came to God. So now, men are calling out to God, which is something they have never seen before. How bad must the earth be? For them to change the way they pursue God in a more desperate way. God, I can't just wait for the average time that you come through the garden. I got to call to you because blessed are those who call on the name of the Lord, that those who call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And God begins to give men different things, different giftings, different, different tools. Uh, prophecy, different things to walk by. I love the way God distributes because Jesus tells a parable and he says, because we're talking about God's giving. This is what we see is that he says he gives to one five, one two, and one one according to their own ability. Because he's a giver. He didn't give unfairly. He gave one five and one one, but it wasn't unfair. It was according to their ability. It wasn't according to their special ability. Because then that would be unfair. To think that Michael Jordan deserves more than you because he is better coordinated than you. To think that uh, 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 someone who can dance is, is more deserving of more from God because they have a different uh, ear for sound and movement than you. That's a special ability that not all get. So God did not distribute to men according to their special ability. 
but unto their own ability, the ability that you have responsibility for. We all have ability, even if no special ability. You know, it, it is a spiritual gift to, to have the gift of tongues. But all have the ability to pray in tongues when baptized with the Spirit. Giving a tongue and the Spirit interceding are not the same thing. There is a spiritual gift of faith. All don't have it. Do all have faith? No. But it is everyone in here is able to operate in faith because we're saved by faith. So there's special ability. And then there's ability. And so when it comes to ability for things like that, Paul said, I wish you would all pray in tongues. Paul said, uh, eagerly seek prophecy because these are things within your own ability. That how much you seek God and how much you pursue God and how much you wait on God and how much you chase God, that's on you. And God distributes to you according to that ability, not according to how you can dribble a ball or how you can hear numbers move or how this and that. No, but, but, but the ability of being disciplined of being trusted, of being dedicated, of, of operating within your passions that God has put in your heart. Or where you sit at the table like a sluggard, and the Bible says he won't even bring the spoon to his mouth. You know, if that man who buried the talent had just at any point got up and went and put it into action, when he came back, he would have got at least half a city. As the one who got 10, made it 10, he got 10 cities. Because God is always distributing. As your ability increases, the giver of life increases the gift. And the question then really gets on to then, where is your heart then when it comes to stuff like this? Because if your heart or your treasure is in the earth, your heart's going to be after all of this stuff and you will bury the things of God. And Because it, it don't take that to get it in the earth. It just takes you selling a little bit of your soul. It just takes you willing to hide what other people will expose. It just takes you uh, willing to, to play ball and be a yes man. It don't take any ability. And people will set aside the things of God because their treasure is in the earth and they'll let their heart run them all over. But if your heart is in the things of God, then you know what? If your treasure is in the things of God, that's where your heart will be. So, so it is not a burden to read his word. It is not a burden to say, when I celebrate and honor the birth of Christ, it is not about the gifts. We'll give you gifts, but no more is it about the gifts. Is a relationship with God about the gifts. My heart don't mind worshiping. Laying down before him is not interrupted by my pride. But what happens? When people don't want what you're giving, when they don't want what you have to give, when people don't want what you have to give, what do you do? You know, the scripture says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever may believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What happens when people don't want what you have to give? That's the story of the birth of Christ. He came on a maybe you'll want this gift. He came on maybe you'll accept it. Maybe you'll want what I'm giving. And we operate like that a lot. Um, the paralyzed man that Peter and John walked up to was paralyzed. He needed healing, but he asked for money. Where was his heart at? Where was his treasure at? He didn't mind staying broken as long as he got paid. He didn't mind weighing down other people's lives and exchanging their purposes and burdening them to carry him everywhere as long as he got a little bit for himself. It's a backwards world that God offers you an abundant life and you sell it out for a little currency. I love the response that, that, that Peter gives him. He, he looks intently at him and tells him, look at me. He says, silver and gold have I none. What I do have, I give you. I had a conversation with my wife. I don't know, a little bit ago. And, 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 and we were talking about, you know, things with the, the ministry. And, you know, I tend to preach long as I want to. hour and a half, two hours, 
whatever it take. And I can't do it today because it's in our building and they got to get in there. But I am going to push it to the limit so when we shut down, we got to shut down and get up out of here because I got to push it to the limit. I was going to be done by now, but obviously I'm not done by now, so <laughs> give me five more minutes, which means ten more minutes. And we were talking about, about stuff like that because we were just kind of like brainstorming at, at different churches and, 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 and what people expect for church growth and what things detract people from what they call a church. And it's, 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 it's a sad story that, that the modern church, what attracts people is not having to be churched at all. 60 minutes in and out the door. Nice lights, nice stage, great decor, this and that. And, and people who are believers are enamored with the stage, enamored with what they call fun. They think that church is supposed to be about them hanging out. With the church is not beyond beef for life. It is not the exchange where you can have the same life similar to what you would have if you were unsaved, but have all of it, and it's just like that, but in the church. So people have given up a desire for Christ, the true Christ, for friendships and hangouts and, and people like me being where I want to be, doing what I want to do and having a good time. And if you ask me to worship and sacrifice that, no, I'd rather perish. I don't want what you have to give. And we were talking this talk and, and looking at that. And, and, and if I'm honest, my wife, she, 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 she's like, baby, you know, two hours is a little long. Not in a negative way, but just, it'll wear you out. It don't wear me out. I'm up here talking. But I know she's honest because I've, I can tell you who's been dozing off this last hour in, in 20 minutes. I can, don't make me call y'all names out because I can see you. <laughs> These lights shine and reflect off the whites of your eyes. You ain't praying. You don't doze into prayer. So she's accurate when she's saying this and not in a negative way. And, um, and I said, well, I said, here's, here's the thing. I said, we ain't got nothing. I really said, we ain't crap. <laughs> and we got nothing to give nobody. And she looked at me like I was crazy. I said, no, honestly, I said, listen. I said, we don't live in a house that people desire to move into. I said, we don't drive a car that everyone aspires to drive. We don't even have a car that's uh, 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 under 10 years old or just right about 10 years old. I said, no one wants what we have. I said, I don't have the, the fashion. I'm not a fashionista where people are like, ooh, I want to be like him. He looks good. I said, when they come into our church, we don't have some glitz and glamour stage and great lighting. We didn't start this church with a $100,000 or $150,000 grant from some church. I said, we don't have this stuff. I said, silver and gold. Have I none? But what I do have and I said, I said, I said, people don't understand. I said, because they don't see you. I said, I watch you all day. Worshiping all day long. Going through music. Praying and getting it, just getting it right before God. I said, so all you really have to give is when you come up here, whether the speakers blow or the sound is bad or people honor you or don't honor you or like, I said, you have the worship life that you have privately and you give it publicly. I said, and I'm glad you really worship because we ain't got nothing. You think these curtains are what the kingdom wants? And I said, I study and chase God. I read more than I know how to read. I read into languages I can't read and then read on how to read those languages and read on just so I can come back to the original thing that stumped me. I said, I read and learn about God and have my relationship with God. I said, so that's what I give. I said, which means if I have to give it for an hour and a half or two hours, if that's as long as people can endure, I said, because it's all we have. 
I give it freely. So as we, we began to talk further, and, and we just come to the conclusion that we don't have anything that is desired to be had by the world. Anyone who comes to a church desiring lights ain't desiring God. And that has nothing to do saying lights are bad. But if that is your requirement for a cool church, you are not of God. And need to get your heart right. You should be able to go to a church that got, got light bulbs, these lights, or flat lights, or whatever. That ain't got nothing to do with whether or not the Spirit of God is there. If your idea of church is what's fun for you, then Merry Christmas. It's all about you. So we don't have anything that the world desires. And that's, that's, that's the thing about this church. If you have a different expectation, let me stop you now. Go somewhere else. Please, if you're here for the first time and you want something else, go sign out a visitor's card and write, I'm leaving and going somewhere else, and don't come back. If you have joined the ministry pretending that you can endure the worship of this house while you await some type of roller coaster event to make sure you enjoy it, go somewhere else. That's hard. That's hard talk. But Peter looked at that man and said, look at me. I say that to everyone in this room when it comes down to the things of God, when it comes to what Jesus was born. Look at us. What we have to give, we give it. If, 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 if you don't want a word about God, if you don't want those who are willing to bow on their faces before God and give God the best that can be produced with the little that we have, if it's, all, if it's about some other form of captivity, well, we don't offer bondage here. We don't offer entertainment. But what happens when you're like Jesus and people don't want what you came to give? We were only called to this area to give what we have to give. Everyone in this room that is called to this church is called here to give what they have to give. And the standard of giving was raised at the birth of Christ. Which means if I normally would give you just 20 minutes from being lazy and study, then I better double down and figure it out because the standard of giving raised with the birth of my God. And here's what I understand, and I'll end with this. Whenever God's plan steps in, whenever God's plan comes up, here comes the witches that look like Christians, the murderers that look like brothers, and the liars that look like they, they're telling the truth about God, stepping up around. You know, Herod said, I want to come worship too. He was a murderer. He was using his fake worship to try to blend in to murder. He was using his lies to blend in to murder. And wise men, so nicely put in the King James Version, in the Greek is magos or magi, which is magician or, or by implication a sorcerer. That's why they followed the stars. They were astrologers. They were witches, and they showed up at the birth of Christ. Herod over here with his murdering self and lying self, he says he wants to worship. I think that we have to answer for ourselves. Uh, do, do, we, do we want that, which is to worship, or do we want it our way, which is... That's the lie that we tell, is you act like you go somewhere to worship, but you really showed up for something else. The word comes through when you scroll your phone. You are a liar. The word, co word comes through when you got a bathroom two and three, four times. You are a liar with a UTI. 
worship comes through and you wait for it to get done so you can get what you came for. Waiting for the preaching to get done so you can get what you came for. And the murderer comes up in him. He wants to kill the boys. You know you are either worshiping truly or you are attempting to kill the Christ in that place. Anyone who comes into the place where they say Christ is and they either truly came to worship or they have intent to kill the Christ in that place. You understand that every time you stand in an atmosphere of worship and don't worship, you weigh down and try to quench the Holy Ghost. And every time you quench the Holy Ghost, somebody who was bound stays bound. Who do you think you are? At least admit you are a murderer of the Christ or the anointing in the house of God. That you think you can be as God. That programs should be created for your fun. We should make lights and this and that because it's Christmas holiday. Shut up. If you felt like I was talking to you, I'm talking to you. Because the enemy shows up like this, attempting to take you out for what you have to give. This is what I understand about doing this. This is what I understand about the birth of Christ. This is what I understand about every prophet in the scriptures. Is that when Adam was created, here come the serpent. Is that when, when Moses steps up, here come Pharaoh and his people. And, and, and when it wasn't, when, when Joshua stepped up, here come this war and that war. When Elijah steps in place, here come Jezebel. Samson comes the judge here comes Delilah and when we get all the way down to Jesus Jesus can't even utter a word yet and here come Herod and the Magi you know no one tries to take you out forgiven what you weren't sent to give though this is why the wicked prosper, and in some cases, this is why some churches seem to just float around and it's all fun, and they don't really, they, they can just last because they're giving something God didn't send them to give. God didn't send the church to give you friendship. God gave you an assignment. And when you desire friendship over assignment, just, you are a Herod. God didn't send the church forward to make sure you have a social club. No, we ought to die for this. So no one comes to murder you when you give what you wasn't sent to give. That's why you do well sitting in a church not serving and not giving of what God has put you there to do. That's why you, 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 you float under the radar and you can complain about this and not like this and move that way and move that way no matter where you go. It don't require nothing of you for you to show up early or stay late or give or, or listen to the Holy Ghost or submit to leadership or submit. It don't cost you nothing because you ain't giving what you were sent to give. And I know I'm talking hard on Christmas, but this is the birth of, of our king who came to give it all. In his 33 years, he didn't have an easy moment. if you exchange the truth for a lie you switch the story out just a little bit let's change a word well then what you give is based on a lie even if it seems good to you I'm not saying the stuff that I'm one versus that one ain't good but Eve was trying to make Adam's life better here this makes you wise this is good for food this is pleasing to the eye she wasn't trying to kill him. She was trying to make him like God. That's a whole other sermon I could talk to wives about trying to make your husband something God never put them to do. And just because it sound good don't mean it's from God. Because if you just change it a little bit, good things are rooted in lies too. to try to kill you because you're already dead. The Bible says you're condemned already if you don't believe what he said. But Jesus, somebody say Jesus. 
he came, he came for this purpose. For this cause did I come, to give my life. He came to give his life. So let the murderer show up if he wants to. This is the greatness of God, is that showing up to kill him was expected by him. That's what he came for. You know, so, so, so he's prepared for them to show up, prepared for them to do this because, because all things are going to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When you're dealing with the word of God made flesh that loves, that's why he came because he loves and he's called according to a purpose that's not my will, but your will be done. So let the murderer show up because I came to lay it down. And there's a difference in all things working together for the good and working together for good because there's good to you and there's the good that he planned beforehand. And then we got to show and prove. Show and prove. And Jesus showed and proved. The scripture says that we're not to be conformed to this world but to be transformed through the truth that we can prove what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God, that we ought to prove God's will. We're to prove it. And this is hard because the whole world wants us to prove God. I tell people in private at times when they ask me, and said, your testimony, you're, you are killing the kingdom. How can you tell somebody about being blessed and you live like that? And by that, I don't even mean in sin. I mean, you always borrow money from somebody. How can you ever witness about the blessing? How can you witness about worship when you are so distracted in a worship service or you, you won't commit to the place God sent you to serve or, or you won't uh, 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 cover your family in prayer or you don't see God except for on Sunday? What can you tell someone about living the life of a worshiper? How are you proving anything? And all they want is proof. Prove it. Prove it. Prove to me there's a God. Prove to me there's a God. You know, there's only one place where the Bible says, prove me. And it's in your giving. Because the standard was raised when Jesus was born. Because if God says, I'm going to give this much, then I'm going to raise the standard so high that when you keep it, it proves me. Prove me in this and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that there wouldn't be room enough to receive. See, if you obey me in this, then watch these things follow you. Don't just believe me for pouring out. Obey me in this because if you do, it proves me. It proves your faith. It proves that you, you believe what you say you believe and then I'm going to show you how you can never outdo me because if you can outdo me, I'm not God. You're God. So watch these windows open. Watch me pour it out from heaven. Watch these things follow after you and chase after you watch goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life and I'm not a slot machine but you should prove me in this I love how God says something so simple like prove me in this because he tells us that the laws that we should keep is love him with our heart, mind, soul and strength and our neighbor as ourself well, it's with our currency that we either serve him or serve mammon. So he says, prove me in it. Give it. That shows that you love me because I love you. And do you know the encouragement of a seed? You know when you sow a seed into somebody? When you sow a seed into a, a ministry or into a budget or whatever and a startup business, do you know it's not even economical? It's all about encouragement. It may help a spot they're in, but they hear in their heart, God hears me. He answers my prayers. He doesn't leave me or forsake me. He said he would do it, that men would give it. His word is true, and it, it's so much encouragement. So, so we show him that it doesn't have a hold over us, and we encourage our brothers who are around us. You know, no believer should ever be digging themselves out of the deepest hole. No church should be trying to figure out how to come up out of a mess, because if we increase the standard, all needs will be met amongst all people. This ain't a message about your money. 
But for too long, this world has taught us that this season was about your money. And instead of dealing with the kingdom, we have given it to our children, given it to ourselves. Men have become lovers of themselves in this backwards world that is created at odds with God, built on a lie, and nothing in it was made to benefit the believer. That's why scripture says to come out. Come out from among them, out of your father's house, and from among your kindred, into a land that I will show you. I'm going to stop there because I have so many things swirling. And we got to be out of here in about 20 minutes. Father, we thank you that you are the redeemer of time. We thank you, God, that you have raised the standard high. That you have set the bar above all that we could. But Father, all we do is pursue you. We chase after you. When we fall short, we know we fall right into your hand. Thank you for the grace that holds us up when the standard is far beyond our reach and we fall. Thank you for the encouragement that a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. So, Father, we chase after you. We ask you to challenge us in every standard of our life and our thinking and our walking and our remembrance of you that in this season, while we do enjoy the, our families, that we never forget to honor you. And, Father, when you convict us in our heart about particular things, let us be quick to change them. Let us not overlook obedience trying to find something to believe above your word. In Jesus' name, amen. No, 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 no. Leave that there. Leave that there. Leave that there. Leave that there. Leave that there for a second. Too, a little too quick. <laughs> Are we still recording? Okay. <laughs> Let me make sure we square. We square on there? Let me tell you something. That what you see? That's how we all should be operating. He said, 20 minutes, let's go, shut it down, go. <laughs> Jediah, never lose that. Never lose that. I honor that. I honor that. He was ready. His obedience was ready to, 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 to bring to death all things that are disobedient. <laughs> but we do got to take the offering. <laughs> when you came in, you received an envelope. The envelope said tithe and offering. We believe giving is worship. We believe giving is something that makes us uh, in the image of God because he is the giver. It is a behavior of one that is made in the image of God or a son of God. And so we do it to honor him. If you give grudgingly, the Bible says don't do that. Don't, if, you, if you're mad about giving, put it back in your pocket. It says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So when it's in your pocket, tell yourself a joke, laugh, take it back out your pocket. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. It says, give what you said in your heart to give, but not out of compulsion. So you should not be manipulated. So giving is a time that you should tune into the voice of the Holy Ghost and allow him to challenge you and lead you so that no man can, can deceive you and you don't ever sit down on your obedience. It's all a time for you in the Holy Ghost. There's digital ways you can give. It's on the screen. If you're watching online, it is in the chat. Give you a minute to hear God. All right, Lord, thank you for speaking quickly. We got to go. Father God, we thank you for the privilege to give into your kingdom. Everything we have comes from you. Father, I pray for every giver, those who have heard your voice and obeyed your, your leading and followed your challenge and, 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 and lived their life after your, your giving freely of yourself that you will bless them exceeding abundantly above all they can ask or think. Father, I pray that you, that you touch all who have a desire to give, but they don't have the means to give. But if they had it, they would give it. I pray, God, that this week you will provide seed for that sower so that they can be obedient to that and follow their heart and your leading next week. And I also pray, God, that if they're lying and next week they don't give it, that you dry it up in the name of Jesus. Now, we won't stand for liars in the house of God. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen.